I think as usual, I've probably tried to pack in too much into this lecture. So I'll see how far um, I, I get. Um, but I, I wanted to use um, the sort of discussion today in a way maybe to expand uh, or offer a kind of counterpoint to how we think about urban metabolism. Um, and in some ways, it has to come with a disclosure that a lot of the work uh, that we do, and, and some of which I'll show you, is hasn't actually been particularly urban, um, but often in more remote regions um, where climatic and cultural conditions really shape context, uh, where logistics are huge challenges uh, as our economic resources. And in fact, that sort of uh, highly charged context is part of, I think, what forced us to start to think at larger scales, which hopefully um, can resonate back to some of the urban questions. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and, and, and because, I should go back to maybe the, the title slide, because um, so much of this work, uh, op, uh, these remote communities need to think about a kind of larger hinterland and territorial, I've actually titled the, the lecture Territorial Metabolisms um, rather than Urban because in some ways um, the discussions will kind of span a range of scales. Um, the study of urban metabolism has largely been tied to an understanding of the city or urbanism as a kind of ecosystem in which inputs and outputs can be accounted for. And a key subtext of urban metabolism has been the development of tools um, and accounting to achieve increased sustainability. Um, in looking up uh, a few years ago, I was involved in a kind of similar uh, discussion, or, or the title was similar. What was interesting is actually how very different the, the discussions were. Um, but, but I was sort of looking up urban metabolism uh, f uh, or kind of images that could accompany a discussion. And of course, I came, up, came across the famous um, uh, drawing of uh, Brussels urban metabolism. Uh, which is sort of analyzing uh, urban inputs and outputs. And then I quickly fell upon this diagram of lactate metabolism in the brain. Um, and I think the sort of similarities in the images are uh, telling and somewhat problematic in many ways. Um, and so in, I think in some ways, um, while the analogies of the biological, the ecological, and scientific processes have held architects and urbanists uh, sort of uh, imagination and attention for a long time, because they give us sort of quantifiable, tangible things to hold on to, I think there are, um, in some ways, limitations to, to that discussion. I mean, and um, I was looking uh, a while back at a book um, called Sustainable Urban Metabolism by Paolo Ferrao and uh, John Fernandez, which was published at MIT a few years ago. And much of the book is a kind of set of rules, in some ways, um, of what um, of how to kind of achieve a, a sort of uh, urban sustainability through through um, notions of urban metabolism. And they write in the introduction: This book is aimed at providing a better understanding of urban material flows and their interaction with nature, making use of the urban, um, urban metabolism concept, which draws an analogy from metabolic processes of organisms. It quantifies inputs, outputs, storage of energy, water, nutrients, materials, waste, and may provide uh, individuals with, with essential impact, uh, essential feedback on the impact of their choices, and they keep going. And I guess part of what I want to do today is um, expand this notion to also include um, how one might understand the sort of social and the cultural within uh, metabolic processes. Um, and, and again, particularly in the later work that I'll show, but I think pervading all the projects, um, is this idea that, that um, the city is a set of processes, but it's also a set of sort of spatial and cultural practices. And how these two can be leveraged together, I think, is where um, design has kind of uh, a particular sort of agency. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk very briefly um, about a set of uh, books that I co-edit with three other people, um, one of which has recently come out, so I'm, it's partly a sort of uh, plug for it. But it has offered a kind of platform for reflecting on some of these um, questions. So Bracket is a, um, a journal which we actually call an almanac um, that looks at the intersection of architecture, uh, environment, and digital culture. And we call it an almanac um, because it's uh, 
meant as a kind of projective platform for reflecting on architecture. Um, and so the idea of, if you think about a Falmer's Almanac, it always predicted the weather for the year coming forward, um, and then sort of speculated on what how the crops would do in response to that environment. And so this site, so a bracket emerged um, six years ago, roughly, um, as a kind of deliberate counterpoint to the, on the one hand, sort of purely scholarly journals, and on the other hand, to the kind of classic design magazines that tend to sort of focus on built work by better known um, offices. And so Bracket is, is um, really foregrounds emerging uh, young architects, practitioners, researchers, um, and we are, uh, we've come out with three. So the first one looked at the idea of farming, um, and farming in the broadest sense, not simply of literary agriculture, but the idea of the production of surface, of harvesting, of collecting, whether energy, uh, literally agriculture, uh, wind, uh, et cetera. Um, the second one, which I co-edited uh, with Niraj Bhatia, um, was called Go Soft and looked at the idea of um, soft infrastructures, soft uh, political structures, um, the idea really of systems that are adaptable and responsive um, to various environments. And I'm going to come back to this one um, because I was in the um, in my piece in there, it was a kind of chance to reflect on notions of site. Um, and the most recent one um, that has just come out, and I have a copy um, for anyone who wants to take a look at it, is called Bracket at Extremes. And it looks at um, conditions of uh, instability, whether ecological, political, economic, all of which I'm fairly certain we are in a heightened condition of at this point. Um, uh, and what, what the role of, age, what the agency of design is in this condition of instability. Is it to sort of uh, remediate and, and return to a kind of state of normal? Does there, do we have a kind of state of normal in relation to any of these questions? Um, and so are there new sort of uh, tropes and, and, and structures by which we even need to think about the role of design in this sort of condition of extreme. So some of the projects, um, for instance, this was a project looking at um, a kind of technical technological enhancement of ecology in the Canadian North where the tree line is shifting because of climate change and so you have weird hybrid species emerging and so this person was looking at could we actually technically engineer through very subtle means uh, a, a kind of um, uh, renegotiation of where uh, various ecological zones are happening. Um, this was a project by a Norwegian architect um, looking at the intersection of tourism and, um, hydro, uh, and thermal, geothermal energy in Iceland. Um, and this was a, pro a, a research paper looking at um, the sort of ecologies of disassembly of large uh, steel ships in Bangladesh and the kind of landscapes and, in a way, metabolisms that emerge from that. So there's a whole host of um, projects that sort of reflect on this question of, um, of, it, of, it, of, of extremes. And in some ways, I think that has motivated a lot of our work. So coming briefly back to this, um, to one of, this, one of the ideas that uh, had emerged in the uh, Go Soft essay um, is this notion of sort of redefining uh, perhaps the notion of site. Um, and so the, the essay was titled From Site to Territory. And I think in some ways I'm preaching to the choir here um, given, given the sort of work that's happening in the exhibition um, and the work of um, uh, people like Fabric and so forth. But this, this idea that um, you know, architecture on the one hand is has increasingly declared itself interested in landscape and urbanism and ecology and infrastructure. Um, and so what are the tools that we need to adopt in order to kind of engage in these various scales of sight? Um, because our sort of conventional tools of analysis of representation um, may not sort of fully serve us. Um, and so in the essay, I was sort of unpacking in a way for myself um, various notions of site, and I won't go through all of it right now, but um, I picked up on an essay by Carol Burns called, um, uh, oh god, I've just blanked on the uh, title of her essay. Uh, it's in a book called Building, uh, uh, Building Context. Um, and she unpacks various notions of site um, from, the, from what she calls a kind of planimetric understanding of site to one that sort of understands site as a kind of series of sort of, um, in a way, kind of historical layers uh, and physical uh, geologies. Um, and so, so 
I, I tried to kind of pick up on some of these questions of how one understands site. So on the one hand, um, I think as architects and landscape architects, we often sort of uh, analyze site as a kind of layered system, right? And we go back to the kind of classic GIS methods where we will pull out, you know, the hydrological layer, the uh, layer of urban fabric, the political boundaries, et cetera. And I think one of the limitations of this is, on the one hand, it starts to suggest that these things are can be decoupled, which they can't. Um, but they also tend to sort of take a kind of given boundary, whatever your one sort of magical square or circle is. Um, but of course, the boundaries of each of these questions are radically different. So the boundaries of a watershed will be different than the boundaries of toxicity, maybe certainly are different than the boundaries of demographic issues or political issues or economic ones. And so in a way, this idea of needing to kind of redefine the boundaries um, by which one even looks at site, I think, is, is sort of key. Um, this is a map of uh, Walmart centers uh, throughout North America. Um, and so when you think of something as simple as a Walmart store, um, there's the store itself, but then there's the distribution uh, hub. There's the whole network of roads and trucks um, and logistics that service it. And so you know, even that, one could say that there's the, there's the site of the store, and then there's the kind of territory of the store. And those are very different scales. Similarly, this is a map of um, arsenic uh, levels in the US. Um, you know, the, the boundaries by which one might study toxicity in a site, obviously the, 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 the sources of toxicity will often be far removed from the actual site. And so again, the kind of boundaries um, with which one looks at a question will vary. Similarly, if you're looking at species migrations on a site, you know, again, their, their territory is entirely different than a human territory. Um, so then um, I was looking at, at um, you know, if you look at Ian McHarg, um, who was in a way the forefounder of GIS, um, he, you know, um, you know, many of his projects uh, developed this kind of layering system. But then what's interesting is he also developed other um, methods of, of sort of analyzing site where he, in a way, reconflates these layers um, to understand it back as a kind of working landscape that has a kind of set of cultural patterns imprinted on it, um, topographies, et cetera. And so this, this notion of sort of looking at the site through multiple um, sort of methods, I think, uh, is important. Um, the other uh, question is, it, you know, again, is what are the tools by which we map these things? Um, this is Buckminster Fuller, in a way, of course, um, developed the famous Di Dimaxian map. Um, and in his book, Integrity and Ideas, where he's talking about this idea of fluid geography, he writes, these populations and technology flows are implicit in the comprehensive concept of the world, in which the accompanying map dramatizes, sees the whole world, its waters, its atmospheres, its electrical properties, as a continuously and reliably operating dynamic systems. Um, and, and I've always loved this map. Um, these are sort of two versions of his Dimaxian map, one where um, the land is uh, kept integral, albeit not in the conventional way that we see our maps, and the water is what takes up the kind of projective discrepancies. And in the bottom image, the water is, is at least in theory, left integral, and the land is what takes up the discrepancies. And so this, this idea that the simply the way in which we draw things um, completely reframes uh, the way we understand a site and hence the questions which we will ask back to it as we design, um, I think is a, is a kind of interesting one. And this is a, um, another map uh, of his. Um, of course, what was amazing about him, given that it was, you know, you starting working in the 30s through the 60s, is this idea of sort of looking at a kind of global scale um, at, you know, issues of electricity or energy or uh, water or resources. Um, uh, I have to say, I think in light of sort of the, the uptake in, in Neil Brenner's discussions about planetary urbanism, and we were discussing this a bit earlier today, that I think there's also limitations to this idea of trying to, you know, there's a point at which as, as sort of designers, one loses perhaps agency and a kind of ability to understand at which one, how one intervenes in a system. And so um, I think part of what we've been interested in is, is sort of examining context at multiple scales, but always at one which one can somehow apprehend. When I see the multiple beautiful maps that come out of Neil Brenner's uh, Urban Theory Lab, there's a moment where you sort of, 
think like there's a lot of lines and I don't, you know, I don't know what to do with all the, the sort of scale of the information. So I think in a way, you know, people like Fuller were forecasting this kind of um, scalar thinking and, and I think the question as designers is like where, you know, what are the scales at which we work and I think different disciplines also work at different scales and different projects demand different scales. So I'm going to try uh, um, and frame th three, maybe slightly more projects um, through um, three sort of fairly simple ideas. Um, the first um, is, is a kind of, um, and these go back to sort of um, this notion of metabolic processes. One is the idea that metabolic processes offer an opportunity for an extrinsic urbanism, um, one in which environments are wired to support new economies, ecologies, and public realms. And so I'm going to show a project um, which is now uh, becoming slightly old. Um, uh, it was one of our earlier projects, but it was a chance to really reflect on the intersection of um, infrastructure, um, energy systems, and public realm. Um, and um, so the project is um, situated in Iceland, which of course is uh, known you know, is got vast geothermal reserves. It's a relatively small country in terms of population. Um, it's fairly unique in that um, almost its entire population is concentrated in Reykjavik. So out of, I think, a population of, I've gotten my numbers wrong now, but 270, something like 100 and, uh, 180,000 live in Reykjavik. So it's, there's a, the, a kind of... Um, uh, a concentration of activity happening in Reykjavik. Um, and, and what's interesting is that um, on the one hand, a lot of its, its economy still relies on things like fishing. Um, it's, it's got this vast geothermal and it's very much actively trying to kind of figure out how to leverage this renewable energy um, to generate new economies. And so this was um, part of the backdrop of the, of the project. Um, it, it was a competition um, launched in 2007 um, to look at a kind of huge swath of the city that was the site of a defunct um, uh, military airport that had been built by the Amer Americans during World War II. So you see the kind of historic city um, to the north and then the site to the south. Um, the other piece of context is that it was, of course, pre-crash. Uh, pre so um, Iceland was, of course, in this kind of economic bubble of optimism. Um, and so the idea of master planning for, to virtually to kind of double the size of the city, um, even at the time seemed optimistic, um, six months later seemed uh, hugely uh, optimistic, or if not naive. Um, but, but, but because of the scale of the project in relation to the original city, it, it, it sort of offered this kind of provocative question of how does one think about a kind of entire, um, an entire city in some ways. Um, and so the first question that, that kind of emerges is what to do with these uh, runways and how, um, how might one on the one hand sort of keep a, a kind of uh, legacy of them um, because of their kind of cultural uh, presence in the city, um, but, but also sort of transform them. And so, and the other thing we were interested in the, it was the idea of understanding public space and, or open space um, as, as catalytic in the development of uh, the urbanism. I mean, much akin to kind of um, uh, uh, infrastructural urbanism, um, uh, uh, landscape urbanism logics, where the open space would actually sort of come first and be the kind of catalyst for design. And so the idea was that the runways would be converted into a set of uh, productive greenways, and that each greenway would have a kind of particular um, sort of pro. pro programmatic role um, in relation to needs of the city. Um, and so, um, uh, so the, the three, the runways had three functions. The um, one going north, south was a kind of ecology and civic runway. Um, the one running at a kind of uh, diagonal this way was a production runway. And the third one that's in pink was a recreation runway. And in many, some of the programs were addressing needs that the brief had called out, and others were ones that we um, uh, sort of uh, overlaid. Um, and so part of the question was this idea of sort of wiring environments. Could we, we leverage the sort of uh, 
sort of incredible um, natural resources of the of the of the territory um, to support production of water, of energy, of green space, uh, of transportation, etc. Um, and part of um, Part of all, one of the things that I would say drives all our work or interest is in trying to leverage what is already there. So looking at uh, whether it's uh, social programs or cultural practices that exist, technological practices that exist. So in a way, there's already this sort of amazing network of geothermal. They already do things like thaw, um, sometimes the sidewalks uh, from snow using geothermal. There's geothermal uh, recreational pools. There are already some greenhouses um, uh, in an effort to kind of, uh, of agricultural production. So in some ways, all the ingredients were already um, there. And so in a way, the idea of wiring was sort of putting in relationship um, these sort of different elements in, in order to make a kind of system of intakes and yields um, of infrastructures, ecologies, and open space. So the first uh, greenway um, was, was, as I say, the kind of production greenway. Um, and it, it ran from the kind of only forest uh, that already exists in, um, uh, well, in the city and in, in a way in the island um, to, um, to the kind of uh, waterfront. And so the idea was uh, imagining the kind of um, run greenway as a kind of barcode of production. So there would be um, greenhouses, aqua farming, markets, uh, greenhouses, uh, even kind of minor urban forestry um, in a bid to kind of make Vasnamiri and Reykjavik as self-sustaining as possible. Um, but the other um, idea was to um, imagine below ground um, a kind of sister bar that was actually um, uh, server farms that would leverage the uh, geothermal. Um, and there, at the time, and I think still now, there are many companies like Yahoo and Google that are looking to put their server farms um, in, in uh, Iceland because of its kind of incredibly inexpensive um, energy. And basically, you, they don't need light, so they would go underground, but the heat that they would produce would be then uh, leveraged to sustain uh, the greenhouses, the public space, et cetera, and create these sort of microclimates. So there was a kind of energetic synergy um, between these two uh, systems. Um, the second greenway um, was the recreation greenway, um, which in a way was much more straightforward. There were call, requested you know, tennis courts and soccer fields, et cetera. And rather than spread them out, we thought about, again, this idea of sort of urban intensification. Um, and they would have various sort of um, topographies created, so they would either be slightly sunken down or raised up to create wind breaks and create a sort of set of urban rooms within this kind of larger linear um, uh, a recreation greenway. And then the last greenway, which was the one that was running north-south, was the civic and ecology one. And it connected um, an existing uh, bird park to the north um, down to a kind of lake uh, and thermal beach in the south. Um, and it was seen as a kind of matrix of sort of ecosystems, landscape rooms, gardens, pools. And each of the kind of swaths then uh, was paired with a kind of civic program, so an aviation uh, museum in homage to the kind of uh, previous airport, um, a library, a science museum, et cetera. Um, and so this idea of sort of pairing the civic and the ecological and that it became a kind of transect of, again, what is already there um, was sort of of interest. And then the various greenways, in a way, created these sort of different neighborhoods that had um, different densities and programs, so uh, smaller scale residential uh, at the bottom left, um, uh, mixed use, higher density, upper um, uh, upper right, sorry, my right and left are not very good, uh, uh, campus typologies, et cetera. And so there was an idea that sort of both the landscapes and the um, building fabric would have this sort of levels of porosity and intensity um, that would ebb and flow sort of depending on where you were. So this was um, one of the kind of meeting points of the greenways. Um, and so really the project was about um, a, a, a kind of, in a way, through this what was a big site in relation to the city, but ultimately a kind of small site, could it relink to these kind of larger um, energy networks within the region, um, production uh, uh, and productive uh, networks um, within, within the country? 
Um, so the second idea that I want to uh, touch upon is the idea um, that the site of metabolic processes extends far beyond the source of activities, changing our understanding of site and territory, which in many ways is what I was talking about earlier. Um, and so I'm going to um, show another, um, what feels like now these are some of these projects are, are we emerged a while ago, but it was a, a fairly seminal project, I think, for us in terms of um, developing a new frame of working. So um, it, the project is called Water Ecologies, Economies, um, Farming the Salton Sea. And it looks at um, the role of water infrastructure um, and, uh, and its potential to become a kind of, again, sort of public, uh, public realm as well as a kind of uh, infrastructural um, project. And so it began with research um, looking at water resources in, in throughout the US and realizing that if you look at the map of where water is and then you look at the map of where the fastest growing cities are, there is a gross mismatch. So 10 of the fastest growing cities are in the driest parts of the country. Um, and this kind of gets amplified in the American Southwest, um, where pretty, you know, um, there are cities and agricultural regions basically sustained entirely artificially through aqueducts and pumping stations and so forth in what is effectively the desert. And so, um, and it's also the site of the kind of famous Roosevelt uh, New Deal, uh, massive infrastructural projects of the 1930s. So the Hoover Dam and uh, Lake Mead and all these sort of um, artificial uh, landscapes and infrastructures that were built uh, come out of you know, this era in this region. Um, and so part of the project became a question of could infrastructure move from the kind of massive engineering project to a kind of softer, more adaptive one that could deal with um, environmental fluxes, uh, ecological fluxes, et cetera. Um, so the, this map is only to show that basically every mile of the Colorado River, which is one of the major rivers in the US, has been either dammed, uh, pumped, uh, somehow manipulated, uh, channelized. Um, so there's nothing left of, uh, there's no uh, original natural river left. It's an entirely kind of infrastructural thing. Um, and what became, um, as we were doing this research, we discovered uh, the Salton Sea, which has um, got a kind of amazing, um, it was fascinating to us because in a way it um, became an emblem of what it means when you're constantly uh, manipulating the landscape. Um, uh, and I don't say that as a kind of like, we should all return to, the, I mean, it's not meant nostalgically, it's, it's, it's meant um, in that it really, um, it is a, a sea that was man-made um, when, a, as they were building a canal, um, the canal broke and flooded this kind of ancient inland sea. Um, and then it started to thrive, and then it went into decline. And I'll tell you briefly the story. But um, so this is the, um, and actually, sorry, what I also should say is that the Salton Sea is the sort of black patch. And what's below it is um, one of the 10th largest agricultural regions in the US. So it's a billion dollar, or $10 billion, I think, industry of agriculture sustained by by the water um, and water manipulations that the Sultan um, is a manifestation of. So this is a kind of map. Um, there's the All-American Canal, which as my colleague likes to say is the sort of uh, largest infrastructural FU to a country because that basically is water that should go to Mexico and gets diverted back to the US. So the US has, uh, Mexico has its own environmental issues now. Um, and that is the canal that at one point in 1905 sort of um, uh, breached its banks during a flood um, and basically filled the Salton Sea. And at the t very quickly at the time, it was designated as an aqueous sump, which means it was um, intended always to be a kind of collect the runoff, the agricultural runoff from the um, uh, uh, from from the from the. Um, River, um, And it's a terminal lake, which means it has no outflow. So it means that it gets progressively more saline through evaporation and through fertilizers that are concentrating kind of toxicity. So there's, no, there's nowhere for that water to go other than to evaporate. Um, 
And so for a long time, it was sort of thriving. Um, it uh, uh, was actually considered the kind of Riviera of California in the 20s through the 50s. Um, and then it hit a kind of ecological tipping point. Um, and so, he, so this is a kind of sampling of the landscape. So you have the kind of infrastructure, this kind of agricultural landscape, um, this kind of coastal conditions. It was a major tourist uh, region. And it hit this kind of point of, eco of ecological decline um, where there were massive bird, uh, bird die-offs, um, botulism. Uh, there was massive fish die-offs. There was botulism in birds, et cetera. And so you can imagine the tourism dried up. Um, and it was on its, I mean, it is still, um, to some degree, uh, a kind of ecological disaster. And so I guess in the early 2000s, there were various studies to figure out what to do with it. And these were various engineering proposals to uh, build walls and sort of sever off part of the lake and let it dry off and keep a little bit for recreation, et cetera. Um, and, and you see the kind of price tags. Um, so these are price tags of you know between two and five billion dollars to simply prevent it. Like it, it didn't produce anything. It simply tried to maintain the status quo without a kind of total disaster. And so what we got interested in was the question of could one. Um, um, uh, actually use the sort of liability of the hypersalinity of the lake to actually be, be seen as something productive. And so rather than see it as a kind of dump, could one in this sort of economic diagram um, salvage some of the water that gets, uh, or some, some of the water from agriculture that's being consumed to grow things that probably shouldn't be growing there in the first place, and, and produce a kind of slightly more um, sustainable economy. So we started to imagine a set of um, pools, um, production pools, harvesting pools, recreation pools, et cetera, all of which would take advantage of um, hypersaline water. So we looked at um, uh, you know, what fish, what, what kelp species, et cetera, could survive in intensely saline conditions. Recreation, for instance, boats love uh, hypersaline because they float more. Um, you know, it's considered, you know, in the, if you go to the Dead Sea, of course, it's considered a kind of luxury to be in these hypersaline conditions. So we tried to kind of, in a way, reverse the logic by which the Sultan had, had been understood. And so on the one hand, there was a kind of larger scale, um, I don't even know if it's really a master plan. It's a kind of economic master plan of inputs and outputs. So understanding where tourists were coming, where water was uh, being exported to, where, um, uh, where uh, other agricultural resources were coming in and out of. Um, and partly the idea was could, through a small set of interventions, could one reactivate the kind of hinterland around um, the Sultan? So we developed this idea, as I said, of sort of small-scale pools that could aggregate um, and uh, could adapt. So as, as something was successful, you could add more. Um, as, as, you, as something went into decline, you could um, remove them. So they were floating ponds that would be sort of tethered to the bottom of the lake. Um, some served as habitat pools. It's a major flish, uh, bird flyover region. Um, some served as... Um, uh, recreation, as I said, in the in the area that had been a kind of recreational uh, district previously, um, and uh, et cetera. Um, and so, and there was also a kind of study of what could happen on land. So, looking at again industries that might uh, saline greenhouses that could take advantage of the salinity, um, producing salt in a kind of return to the namesake of the Salton Sea. So, um, evaporating some of the water uh, for water production and harvesting, but then harvesting the salt salt as something that could be exported. Um, um, so these were these kind of industrial pods, and the and the pools could moor um, could moor to the kind of new shoreline boardwalks at places when you needed to harvest, and then could go back um, uh, and be tugged out into the into the lake. There was also an idea of sort of remediating some of the water that's most toxic as, before it flows into the. Um, before it flows into the uh, lake um, through a set of kind of remediation pools that would remove some of the toxins. Um, this was a kind of recreation zone. 
Um, and looking also at sort of existing technologies, um, floating wetlands, um, mobile water transportation systems um, that are looking at harvesting water and bringing it from Alaska to various parts of desert America, um, fish, fish farming methods. So looking at existing technologies that would kind of render this sort of project uh, possible. Um, and so this was a kind of quick study of how the sort of uh, water evaporation and salt formation might work. And I, won't go into the details of it. But part of what interests us in our projects is looking from the kind of macro scale down to the kind of uh, more detailed scale to see you know, what it means as it kind of hits the ground um, spatially. And so really, the project was a kind of argument um, for a kind of infrastructural entrepreneurialism. Could uh, infrastructure or, or could, could a region that had been entirely dependent on a few set of um, a crops um, as another, as the lake was sort of going into decline, could one sort of expand um, the things that were produced um, and sort of renegotiate how water was attributed to produce new economies um, as well as new public realms. So I'm quickly going to show um, an excerpt from a book that is coming out, hopefully, next <laughs> month. Uh, it's at the printers. Um, uh, which um, looks at the Canadian North. So we've been looking at the role of architecture in the Canadian North for um, six or seven years now. Um, and it, it began with sort of early phases of research. Um, a whole host of projects, which I won't get into today, um, emerged from it. And, and then it kind of invited a reflection back to kind of synthesize a lot of the research that had been done in, in sort of fragments to support various design projects. Um, so to give you a, a little bit of context, um, um, many people have the kind of um, uh, what I call the National Geographic image of the Canadian North, the sort of polar bears, the icebergs that are melting, um, and very little recognition that there are people um, and communities uh, and infrastructures. Um, and, and this is, in a way, how we got interested, is, is just sort of recognizing that there's a whole reality to the North that Canadians don't know about, um, let alone anyone else. And so I've always loved this photo because it sort of speaks, on the one hand, to the kind of you know, image of the tundra, but then you've got the electrical pole the Jeep and the uh, little cabin all um, you know, holding on for dear life. Um, this is also a photo we've um, came across uh, in our, and kind of fell in love with. Um, it's a building by a famous French Canadian architect who built a lot of schools in the Callaway in the 60s, um, had a kind of total belief that technology was a sort of solution to all uh, architectural ills of the North. And, um, developed a whole system of kind of prefabrication um, and produced some quirky, albeit I kind of like these buildings. But the sort of conflation of modernity and tradition that I think the image speaks to, I think, is powerful. Um, and a lot of our work in particular is focused on Nunavut, which is in the eastern Arctic, which is 85% Inuit. And so you have many people have said, um, and one of their most outspoken sort of uh, Spokeswomen, um, Sheila Watt-Cloutier, who was um, uh, shortlisted for the Nobel Peace Prize, um, speaks about the idea of going from igloos to internet in 40 years. M many people say that there is no other group that has gone, undergone a kind of such radical social transformation in such a short time. So you, there's, there's always the discussion about you know, the Canadian and generally the polar world has a quarter of the world's undiscovered oil and natural gas. And we see these maps and we um, uh, see the, 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 the climate change maps of ice shifting. Um, but this is the map of all the cities north of 60 in Canada. Um, to put it in context, the entire population is 110,000, which is probably you know, I don't know, the size of Mechelen or something. Um, so you have a huge, a huge territory um, with these tiny populated communities. The largest two cities are 20 and 22,000. In Iqaluit, the capital is 7,000, and you quickly drop down to 2,000, 1,000, and a few hundred. Um, and so the challenges of um, of providing, uh, or you know, and we began by imposing, but now there's a kind of expectation of modern services, of education, of health, of internet. How you deliver that in this kind of vast geography um, became a kind of fascinating question to us. 
Um, and so we started documenting the kind of figure grounds of these many uh, uh, often tiny communities. Um, this is Iqaluit seen from the ground, um, or from the air, I should say. Um, and so uh, you can see that the notion of planning has not yet percolated. Um, they, you know, many of these began as military camps, and the legacy of that is still very present. Um, we've imported southern models of architecture, of infrastructure, so you get these sort of funny bungalows um, that are, in a way, ill-adapted. Um, everything in particular in Nunavut has to be delivered by boat in the summer or by plane in the winter. So if you want your IKEA couch, you put in an order, it comes in July. Um, if you're building a building, you figure out every piece of wood, every piece of steel you need, you pre-order all your insulation. If you miss the boat, literally, um, you either are paying a fortune to ship that insulation on a private jet or, uh, or you're waiting a year. So, so the kind of challenges of um, of life in the north are, are kind of, um, I was saying earlier, sort of surreal. Like it's, it, it sounds like a kind of science fiction, but it's not. Um, and you also, particularly in Nunavut, it's an incredibly young population. 50% of the population is under the age of 25. And so you have this kind of youth that is merging traditional culture and modernity. So they're on Facebook, but they're going out hunting with their grandparents. They're listening to hip hop, but they're you know learning in Nutatuk. And so there's this kind of amazing hybrid culture. And part of our observation was that architecture hadn't been nearly as adaptive as um, the people. So um, we, early on, before we developed the projects, had done this sort of broad research and had started to classify it into um, ecology, settlements, uh, what were resources, monitoring, transportation. Um, and we kept these cue cards, and they kept multiplying. And they became the seeds for many of the projects we developed. But they also then became the seeds, um, and they became part of the exhibition, but they became the seeds of the book, which I'm going to try and do I have like five more minutes? Is that OK? Um, for this book, which we've now finally, finally, finally finished. <laughs> um, so the, the book is organized very much like that kind of a, initial research into five themes, urbanism, architecture, mobility, monitoring, and resources. And, and the title of the book is Many North Spatial Practices in a Shifting Territory. And this notion of shifting um, of spatial practices is, I think, important. And it comes back maybe to my critique earlier on about you know, a, a kind of um, accounting version of urban uh, metabolism, which is that um, what we started to observe is that, um, first of all, architecture is not the only thing that leaves a physical imprint on the land, which I think everyone here recognizes. So, um, you know, roads, particularly in the north, you know, completely transform landscapes. They produce or remove connectivity. Um, uh, monitoring produces a kind of network of research stations um, that then have various kind of impacts, uh, positive and negative, et cetera. Um, and so we were trying to, it, it deliberately wasn't simply architecture, and it, it, it looks primarily at the last 100 years of sort of um, transformations um, through a set of timelines, essays, interviews with specialists, and case studies. Um, and, but it also tries to document um, sort of modern engineered permanent uh, infrastructures and buildings, and also um, impermanent uh, indigenous um, things. Um, so I'll give you a few examples. So these are some of the timelines that introduce each chapter that try and give a kind of quick overview of you know, the policies that supported you know, settlement forming or housing or monitoring. Um, we also have a kind of technology index where we basically sort of started to think about architecture as simply one technology among many that shape the north. So you know, one could put a house, a road, a boat, uh, and, a, and an ax in a way as a kind of continuous lineage of tools that allowed inhabitation. Um, I'm going to think I'm going to skip some. These are some of the kind of influences. Um, one thing that was particularly powerful is there's a Canadian geographer called Louis Edmond Amelin who talked about um, Nord the, sort of Nordicity and started to classify um, the different north that he defined. So he had um, near north, middle north, extreme north, and he had a kind of way, actually, a kind of actually accounting way of trying to calculate what, what fell into what category. Um, and he also recognized that 
um, things that at one point were considered far north became middle north. So if, if economies developed in a place, if infrastructures developed in a place, they lo lost some of their n n polar value. And so it raised interesting questions of, you know, is it Callowit, which has now grocery stores and uh, lots of cars, is it less northern than the little town that doesn't have the grocery store? You know, like, are these things calculatable or are they uh, perceptual? Um, so these are some of the kind of landscapes um, that emerge. We started to make our own sort of maps trying to define north, so looking at it as political boundaries, as uh, pl tax lines, you get benefits for living a certain distance north, looking at ethnographic lines, tree lines, um, permafrost lines, uh, ecozones, uh, where the roads end, um, Amla's definitions of, of middle, far, and extreme north. Um, and what became interesting is that these were the multiple, and these were only some of the many norths that one could define, right? Depending on how one, uh, what one was looking at, and it goes back to this idea of you know how you frame the very notion of site is is partly dependent on what you're looking at. So I'll show you just a few case studies. Um, from the settlement section, we looked at things like the growth of Iqaluit as a capital. Um, these are all the communities in Nunavut and their kind of rates of growth. So it began, as I said, as a kind of military outport um, of, the, of the Americans in the Second World War with very, very basic infrastructure, um, only a few buildings, very limited, infra you know, even social infrastructure. And then you see it gain both complexity of social infrastructure and built form. Um, as it goes, um, it's very responsive to the kind of geology of the land. It's so expensive to build that you only build on certain soil conditions. So you get the strange phenomenon where you get sprawl in a place where you'd least expect it because it's still cheaper to kind of skip over a rock formation and build, you know, 100 feet further um, than to kind of densify. So it's interesting kind of phenomena. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. And this is uh, the view of Iqaluit today from the air and its kind of sprawlingness through the landscape. We looked at things like northern utilities, um, so how the delivery of water and energy um, uh, produces kind of spatial impact at the scale of the city. So this was, in, there's a unique phenomena called a utilidor when you can't run pipes underground. Um, and so they're run above ground in, in heated conduits. Um, and, uh, and, it, and so some parts of a city are have trucked water and oil, and some have it delivered through pipes above ground. Um, these utilidors have produced a kind of compactness because they're so expensive to build. So it has even energy infrastructure starts to shape the kind of built form. And then it has it sort of winds its way through the city. Um, and so this thing that in most places is kind of invisible suddenly becomes you know, a set of urban walkways and, and, and sometimes urban obstacles. Um, I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to show you maybe one last one, uh, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so um, this was um, looking at Inuit Trail. So here's a kind of case of something that is completely ephemeral. Um, we look, used the work of an anthropologist who had been documenting with elders their trails, looked at the kind of names for snow, um, looked at what they pack when they go out on the land to hunt, so the kind of tools, again, um, and instruments. Um, but then simultaneously, in terms of mobility, we would also look at kind of permanent infrastructure. So the Dempster Highway is the only road that goes to the Arctic Ocean. Um, it crosses a whole host of eco zones. Um, it has um, crews that permanent work camps that um, move up and down the road to constantly rebuild it because with permafrost, parts of the road will collapse and they kind of have to reconstruct it regularly. Um, it's got this kind of huge berming system, so you have to build up about two, me two to three meters of gravel just to kind of deal with the permafrost, um, uh, so, which you see here. Um, and so this is what kind of erodes at certain moments. Um, Fascinating things like it crosses a river, the Mackenzie River twice, um, and, at the, and um, they, it, they can't afford to build bridges, and so there are ferries in the summer that act as a kind of go-between, and in the winter, it's an ice road, um, and you just, you just kind of drive over the frozen uh, river. But in the three weeks of freeze and thaw, 
um, the road basically closes down because there's no bridge. And so what's fascinating is that in Nuvik, the town with the utilidor that we looked at a minute ago, um, the price of milk quadruples in those three weeks. Um, and so this, this notion that you know, we think of our, we take for granted, I think, infrastructure in our cities because, you know, it's rare they fail, um, seasons don't really matter to us. Um, and in the context of the North, the kind of intimate interrelationships between building infrastructure, seasonality, um, and traditional practices really get heightened. Um, and, and, I, and although this is a kind of extreme condition, I think this sort of notion of, of of looking at our environment um, with kind of fresh eyes and looking at it through calendars and at multiple scales in a way translates to kind of any context. And so hopefully in that sense, it's a sort of, um, uh, ha has a kind of relevancy in relation to the discussions today. So I will end it there. Thank you.